Okay, so this is the spring 2020. Evolution unit, okay? And unfortunately for us, as of now, we still have an exam, a state of end of course exam to prepare for. And our end of course exam is going to cover everything in the year, including evolution. So we need to try to get as much of this done this during this break as we can. And I say that because a lot of you might be going through some stuff. You might have to take care of some people at home, or there might be all kinds of things you have to do that I'm not aware of. So we're going to do our best to cover as much as we can, and I'm going to go over the material about 10 pages at a time and make sure that you understand the, the concepts, or at least try to explain the concepts. You have some things on the web page, including uh, some interactive activities uh, about evolution. And you also have a, a textbook chapter. They go over the concepts as well. So hopefully with these resources, we'll be well on our way to be prepared for this exam. The first page you see here is just a checklist of all the different topics that we're going to cover. As you, get, as you cover the topic, as we discuss it, as you read about it, as you answer questions on it, you should go ahead and check off your list. You know, uh, yeah, I get it. I had, I've done the work. I'm ready. I've done the work, I'm ready, I've done the work, I'm ready, I've done the work, I'm ready. However, as you're doing this, you're taking notes, or you're answering the questions, and you think you have them right, and you, you think everything's going well, please remember you have to check your work. You have to check your understanding. If you're not checking your understanding, you're, you can always end up you can always end up thinking you understand something when really you got the wrong answer. So that's easy to do. It's always easy to do no matter what the topic is. So the best thing you can do for yourself is every time you go through uh, a topic and a, 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 a series or bits of information, you go ahead and do some questions. Try to find a practice quiz online. Uh, when we get back to school, of course, I will quiz you, and we will we will ask each other questions. We'll do activities to make sure that all the topics are well understood the way that they should be. But the more you practice yourself, or test yourself, the more as you quiz each other through social media. You don't have to actually meet in person. You can go through and and. Uh, and check your understanding. Make sure you understand the words and the topics and the concepts the way they, they're meant to be understood. Then they, they show you here how, how, you, how the workbook works. So they show you all the different components of it. And how she, you should use the activities. Again, the activities are meant to see if you understand the ideas, understand the topics. I've seen a number of you go right to the activities to try to fill in the answer without reading. How many times have students come to me with questions where I've just, all I've done is pointed to the answer that's in the text. The answers to these questions are right here in the text. Don't do the word search strategy mistake where so many of you start off with the question then go try to find the answer in the paragraph don't do that read it process the information think about it if the reading is not enough you have your chapter reading you have what this video is discussing so there's absolutely no reason why you should be going right to the question and then going back and reading and trying to find the answer in a word search solution uh, strategy. That works for an exam. 
when you're taking a, a standardized exam, SAT, ACT, AP exam, if you want to look at the question just so that you can read with meaning, that's fine. But now that you're doing initial learning and work out, working out problems, you should start with reading, look at the diagrams, try to figure out what the diagrams is showing you, and then go back to the question and try to and then go back to the reading if you have to. All right. So again, when you're looking at the activity page, they tell you there's some related there's some related articles. You can look up the word macroevolution in this case. The evolution five big questions you can look up, right? You can uh you know, you can look these things up. You don't have to go to any specific web page. You can just go ahead and do a Google search on it. I'm, my bet is there's a Khan Academy on the five big questions of evolution. Interpreting activity coding system, right? So the A induces application knowledge to solve a problem, right? So here's where it includes the application of knowledge to solve a problem. So when you are looking at a problem like this, and A, and A level activity, what you're doing is you're looking at an application of what you should have learned from the video, from the chapter, from this reading. And if you're able to answer these questions, then that's part of the way that you check your answer. Now here are some command words. These are words that you should be able to look at and know what they mean when you see analyze, annotate, apply, ap you know, appreciate, calculate, compare. You should be able to n understand what they mean by words like this. All right. So in this concept map of ev for evolution, it l it helps you understand how the different components that we're going to be discussing are linked together. And obviously it's going to be important for you to understand the origins of life, the evidence that supports evolution, the human inter interventions in evolution, the mechanisms by which evolution occurs, and the patterns that evolution, that evolution creates that allow us to predict future events or to, or to predict where one uh, species, how one species is related to another. So you don't have to memorize these orders, but you can see this, this is foreshadowing what we're going to be covering through the whole unit. It's also as you go through the, the work, come back and look at the concept map. As you learn about artificial selection, Come back and think and look at this map and see how is artificial selection connected to other things. And it's these connections and understanding these connections as we move through this unit uh, that's going to help you answer questions and that are more complicated that are, that are asking you to apply. In application questions, it's, uh, it's incredibly important to understand the relationship between the ideas rather than just memorizing the definition of one concept. So as we go through this first unit, you have to think about these key terms, and we'll discuss each of those. Some of them you've already heard of, eukarya and archaea. There is another checkbox. Check it's looking at objectives. And you have to ask yourself, can you discuss the possible origin of membranes in the first prokaryotic cells? Can you describe the primordial environment that's likely led to events form uh, uh, led to the formation of life on Earth? If you can discuss these things and, and look at those command words, what does describe mean? What is what does outline mean? What is describe? What is discuss? What is explain? What's the difference between the two? And so think about these command words when you see these, and can you do this? If you can't do this then you have to work at developing your ability to do this. And don't forget your key concepts. These are key concepts. So if you don't if you're looking at this and you're like, well what does this mean? Then you just don't know. 
And you have to go back and look it up and make sure you're ready for the exam. All right. So when we're looking at the formation of life, we have to ask ourselves, what is life made of? And everyone in the class should be able to sell, say that the building block of life is a cell. And if the cell is the building block of life, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is a cell made of? How do you make life? If there's nothing there, if there's just a big rock, how do you make life? Well, life has to be made, the cell has to be made from, and, I, and I, I'm going to assume that Everybody's able to do this because we've worked on it for so long and you've taken so many tests and quizzes that at this point I would expect that everyone would be able to answer that a cell is made from biomolecules. And if someone said that cells are made from biomolecules, then I would expect that someone else would be able to say that the biomolecules that they're made of would be lipids and amino acids or proteins, right? Well, let's just start with the with the grander things, move to smaller, right? The uh, proteins and uh, carbohydrates. and nucleic acids. And I would hope that they would understand that this is going to be some kind of carbon chain and that somebody else would say, well, that you need amino acids to make proteins. And somebody else would say, well, this is uh, these are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen and one to two to one ratio, right? You know, that, that's kind of the, the hope. And then nucleic acids, uh, one would hope they say some kind of nitrogen, some kind of nitrogen uh, based base, some kind of nitrogen base is involved there. So there'd be nitrogen and, and there'd probably, be, and hopefully somebody else would say, well, there's probably phosphorus. There's uh, probably no sulfur, but there's certainly carbon, and so there's hydrogen, and there's oxygen, and probably some nitrogenous base, you know, some kind of base, including a ribose sugar or deoxy. So hopefully people are able to, you're able to, answer these questions this kind of question when you see the origins of life you're asking well how did these how did these molecules come to be like how did they just form is it some kind of magic what conditions would allow for these biomolecules to form so that the first cell could form so people have asked this question, and, and really, I mean, this, can anyone ever really know? Uh, they, the problem is just no. But we can, we can make some guesses, and we can, we can test some ideas. We can say, well, life is made of this. So is this stuff, the, are these elements out there? How would we know? Well, we can take a look through, through telescopes, and because of something called red shift, well, we don't have to get into and the and something called a, uh, a spectroscope, we can look at the light coming from other planets, and we can tell how much of certain molecules and atoms and elements there are in any particular region of space. And, and how do we do that? Well, as light travels through different molecules, let's say water. H2O. 
as life as light hits it it absorbs it and re, and water absorbs light and and it re-emits light so when the molecule absorbs this light and re-emits light the light frequency is changed so it might have gone in one color and come out another color and the color difference is very, can be very small but that that machine that I mentioned earlier it's called the spectrophotometer we have big ones we have small ones we can actually tell the difference as we look through the spectrophotometer and look at at the light coming in what we see is a is a pattern a pattern of bands different color bands and each molecule each element has its own pattern and we can test that because we can look at those patterns here on earth we can look at these molecules by shining a specific frequency of light into the uh, uh, sample of that molecule and look at the pattern that we see uh, and identify it and then we can look at space we can take our telescopes and point them at, to space and we can look and we see what molecules are out there because we see those same patterns in space that we see here on Earth. So when we look at space and we see these these clouds of gases or we look at a specific star we, or we look at a specific planet, we can tell if there's water there. We can tell if there's uh, hydrocarbons, if there's methanol, if there's carbon dioxide, if there's carbon monoxide. We can tell these things because we can look at those spectral patterns that we can see through a spectrophotometer or a spectroscope, excuse me. Now, the idea that these this interstellar gas and it's dust and gas, when we look at these these giant galaxies, there's obviously a lot of space in space. And as we have all this gas, there's this thing called gravity that starts pulling everything around. And as it comes around, as the stuff starts, as this dust, this diffuse dust, interstellar dust, gets caught up in gravity, it gets pulled closer and closer to a center, like water going down a drain. And that those molecules, those atoms, they start to fuse in a process called fusion. Uh, and the sun is born. A sun is born. The sun is this really, really super gravity, really highly dense, massive object. It's incredibly big. If you can imagine, if you can imagine that something like 1.3 million Earths, if this were the sun, it would take something like 1.3 million Earths to fill up the sun. You can take 1.3 million Earths and put in everything that you know of and then everything underneath our feet. You put 1.3 million Earths into this ball of fused elements and molecules. They're getting just, well, it's mostly hydrogen and helium just getting fused together and that fusion releases a lot of heat and cosmic rays and different types of radiation and that that energy goes flying out into space and we are sitting here the third rock from the sun in the third orbit away from the sun you know the first being mercury the second being venus and then earth you have you know this this power this energy comes and warms our our green planet our blue green planet and so when we look at, at the solar system, the sun looks big, but it's actually really massive. And there are some suns that are even bigger than that. So it's a lot of mass that it goes into it. And that makes sense if you think about it. If the sun's been burning for, if something's burning, eventually, event, I mean, this is just our common sense, right? What we experience every day. If the sun is burning and it's burning fuel, then eventually the sun is going to run out of fuel, right? 
So, you know, and it's been around for billions of years. So how can something burn for billions of years? Well, it has to be really, really big. It has to have a lot of stuff. And so when you're when we look at the sun, we really think about it. It makes sense that the sun is that giant, but it's still kind of scary. At least it is to me. It's just massive ideas. Anyways, the sun kept swirling. <coughs> As things kept swirling, there were other gravitational pulls, other smaller celestial objects that formed, and we called those planets, and they continue to revolve around the sun to this day in a circle because of gravity. It's an actually an ellipse. It's not a circle, but not a perfect circle anyways. Different distances from the sun, all the way from the planets to the planetoids to the asteroids, all these things are uh, circle around the sun. Well, there are these other things that we call comets, and they're in bigger orbits around the sun. Now, these are orbits around the sun. The sun is these orbits we call our solar system. So the system is the, the stuff that's going around the, the planets, uh, around the sun. And they're very, very, the, the solar system co- continues to go, you know, way out here. We have an asteroid belt, and then we have Mars, and we have all different kinds of gas giants. Then we have the Kuiper Belt. But in any case, you have all these planets out there. Well, they got these these objects that come around every once in a while, and depending how often they come around depends on how far away they are. But there are these things called comets. And when we look at the sky, we see them. A lot of people have always thought of them as as being on fire, right? That, you know, great balls of fire from an old song. Because we see that they have these, these long tails. Well, what it turns out is these tails are not fire this these long white tails that we see in the sky if you ever see a comet they're kind of cute they're kind of beautiful and uh, very uh interesting to watch these comets come flying around the thing is that they they're going around the sun they're going around the sun in a very odd orbit they go around in in an elliptical orbit So they actually leave our solar system and come back. So they're going around the sun, but they might come every 100 years. They might come around every, you know, 20 years or whatever it is. Whatever the period is depends on how far out it goes. And so they're really going very fast, and and they're just circling in a really weird elliptical orbit. The details are not really important for our discussions today. But this, these are made of ice. These are giant balls of ice, interstellar ice. It could be made, I mean, I say ice, obviously mostly water, uh, but there's going to be other stuff in there. And this, these comets are, were here from the very beginning of our solar system. So, and so were these, uh, these, uh, these asteroids from the very beginning of the solar system. They, uh, they uh, have been around. So these comets, the reason they have a tail is as they as this ball of ice gets near the sun, the the water starts to melt and then it starts to turn to gas and, the, and since it's moving, the gas goes off into space and the ball keeps going round and round and eventually, obviously, this ball of ice will melt away. But these these things are very large, obviously, because they've been around for a long time. So the that comet eventually will. Will disappear, will will melt away, or evaporate away, and there'll be there are several comets, and, and I'm not sure exactly how many, but there are not numerous comets that go around in different orbits. They come around at different times, around our solar system, in different directions. You know, uh, so 
And of course, our solar system is just one of many solar systems in our, in our galaxy, in the Milky Way. And our galaxy is only one of many galaxies. So when we start to think about how, you know, what space is, there's a lot of stuff out there is the point. And when we're talking about how molecules first form, we have to ask ourselves, well, how is it that, you know, you can get something as complicated as an amino acid or a quinone. Quinones are used in, in photosynthesis and in the electron transport chain in photosynthesis to transfer electrons. How is it that quinones can form? Well, it turns out that these, and we, we've done these experiments in cloud chambers, and those cloud chambers are basically just, just uh, these isolated little balls of gas and we control what gas goes in them, right? It doesn't have to be a ball. It can be a, a cube or whatever it is. And we can run electricity through it. We can run a wire, a positive and a negative, and connect it to a battery or some kind of power source, and we put whatever gases we want. We control the gas that's in here, the cloud, right? And as we run electricity through it, we see what kind of gases can form or what kinds of molecules can form. So we've done that, and we've noticed that in doing that in experiments, in, in labs, we've noticed that we can form all kinds of, of compounds like ketones, nitriles, ethers, alcohols, quinones. These are things, these are these organic molecules, these biomolecules that we see in life. We see, we can make some of these rudimentary molecules in these chambers. These are the things, the building blocks of cells, we can, we can make them in chambers. And what we've noticed is that we can even get amino acids to form. That's that Uri experiment we'll be talking about. And so these molecules can form simply by adding a lot of energy, a lot of heat, under the right conditions. And what we find when we look at, at, at if we add ultraviolet radiation, which comes, which comes from the sun, and we, to these little balls of, of these little capsules of ice that are form in space, right, that they make these biomolecules. That these little capsules of, of water and, and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and methanol they come together and freeze in this interstellar ice, and because of ultraviolet radiation, all these different components of these biomolecules can come together, and they can form. They can form the bio, the molecules that are necessary for life. So now, at this point, you you should be able to answer all three of these questions, right? Now, is it going to be easy? To, is there? Can you put, can you do a word search and find those those answers? These questions, no. But if you think about what I've said, and you think about what you've read here, you should be able to answer these questions, or at least come up with an answer. So let me just go ahead and and, and read this with you. So just how sampling and chemical makeup of a comet. Remember, what is a comet? A comet is a ball of ice. So, circling around the sun in a very large orbit been here since the beginning of the solar system how might that help us understand life's origins when you think about life as a cell that's composed of biomolecules then explain the significance of space uh, um, uh, significance of molecules from space that naturally form capsule like droplets when added to water capsule like droplets, right? When you, so molecules that, that that come together and form capsules in water. How might that be significant? And you might want to you might want to read something like this, right? Right here, and think about it, right? 
then explain how scientists were able to know about the existence of complex organic molecules in space. There again, I, you can, we can take a look at something like what we've discussed. Also, you might want to take a look at something like this. All right. That's all I can do for you on this page.